I like the way he says things. And so a few months ago, I just said, crazy idea. He lives in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. I wrote him and said, hey, John, I'm Ray. You want to come speak at the Village Church? And he wrote back and said, that sounds like a fun idea. I'd love that. So uh, we actually met for the first time this morning. Uh, We've talked and Skyped and uh, been in contact for the last couple of weeks. But that he would come on this week after the the, the week that all of us have experienced, um, I just feel like the timing is just perfect. And I think he has a message for the church. It's resonating in my heart. I just know it's going to resonate in your heart. Would you give a warm village welcome to John Pavlovitz? Good morning, friends. This is a a difficult day to visit a community. You know, I. I don't know you and you don't really know me and it's hard to just show up and act like I know you or that I understand what you're going through as a community. And as the band was singing, I was thinking about that song I've sung so many times that says you work all things together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. And that's not an easy song for a lot of us to sing today, is it? There are days when you can't sing. And if you're here today and you can't sing, that's okay. Let your brothers and sisters around you have the strength to sing, sing. And let today be about whatever it needs to be about, whether it is anger or fear or doubt or worry or defiant joy. Let that be what it needs to be for you today. So could we just rest for one second and breathe and just be exactly who you are today. Make no apologies. And so God, we come before you in the condition of our souls, authentic before you and before one another. Speak to us in this place and time, in your name, amen. Well, I did want to share a few things about me, just so you'd know where I'm coming from, how I got where I am in this spot today. Um, I grew up in a fairly traditional Italian Roman Catholic family, which I like to say means I was raised on gluten and guilt. (laughs) You know, I had a lot of pasta and a lot of repentance. And, you know, 47 years later, I still have a healthy appetite for both. It's funny how that works. And, you know, growing up, we, we had a home but we really didn't need it. The home was just an expensive, elaborate covering for the kitchen, right? That was where our Italian family lived. You know, there at the kitchen table, we sat and we talked and we argued and we gossiped and we entertained and we ate and we ate and we ate. But it's around that table in that daily experience of gathering that we really became a family, that that's where we became who we are. And so I loved taking my place at the table and just listening and just being a part of it. And it was always so exciting for me as a little kid. But then there were other special days. Holidays were really special days because those were the days that we outgrew the kitchen table and we moved up to the dining room table and we could gather more people there. And then it got even better. When the gathering got really large, my father would go into the garage and he'd bring out these two massive pieces of wood And we would grab either end of that table and we would pull on it. It would magically slide open and he would put those two pieces of wood in. And we would put more chairs around. We'd actually literally expand the table so that we could welcome more people. I want to talk to you about that today, about expanding the table of your hospitality. But, you know, growing up, I had two things that not everyone has. The one thing I had was a family who loved me. I had people around me who said, you're beautiful, you matter, and you have gifts and talents, and you can do anything that you want to in this life, and we are for you. And we don't all have that. So I had this family that loved me, but I also had this other great story. I had this God story. And in my God story, God was, and God was good. And this God made everything but still knew me intimately and loved me completely. And it was, and I believe, 
is a true and beautiful story still. So I had this story of a family who loved me. I had this story of a God who made everything but knew me intimately and loved me completely. But I also had some false stories too. I inherited some false stories about people of color, about gay people, about homeless people, about addicts, about atheists, about born again Christians. And in all the false stories that I inherited, those groups of people were to be feared or avoided or at best looked at with extreme skepticism because something about my story told me that they weren't quite as deserving of the love of this God as I was. Something in my stories told me that they were just slightly inferior to me. Now, it was never explicitly said, but I could feel it. You know how that is? When you feel something is there. And this wasn't about people in my life intentionally misleading me. I think the people in my life were just surrounded by people who looked and talked and thought and believed the way they do. Do you know what that's like? See, when you're around people who look and talk and think and believe the way you do, your table is going to be small. So I had a loving family, I had a big God, but I had a small table. I had a table that was far too small for the God that I said I believed in. And if I had stayed there, I probably would have been a pretty nice guy. I probably would have felt loved. I would have had good people around me and I would have had a table that was far too small. But fortunately, God gave me a gift. And God gave me the gift of the city of Philadelphia. Any Philly friends here? Solidarity. Cheese steaks forever. Go Philly. Go Eagles. But see, I was going to school I was living in upstate New York, but I was going to school for graphic design and illustration, so I got a scholarship to go to the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. And you know when you go to a carnival and you've got that game where you've got the ping pong ball and you're gonna throw it into a fish bowls, and if you get it in, you get to take the fish home in the little Ziploc bag, right? And you know that if you get that fish home and you just drop them into a tank, well, the system shock is gonna overwhelm them and pretty soon you're gonna have a dead fish. Well, me arriving in Philadelphia, it was like being dropped from 15,000 feet into the city of brotherly love. And I was living right there in the heart of the city. And I got a front row seat to diversity like I'd never experienced it. To see poverty like I'd never seen it before. But I got to see this poverty and this diversity, not as people groups and not as discussion topics, not as hot button issues. I got to see this as people. They were my neighbors, they were my classmates. I was living alongside them. I was learning their stories. And so what God began to do there in Philadelphia was he rewrote my false stories about people. And he expanded the table of my hospitality. And he really began to prepare my ministry even though it was 10 years away because at the time I didn't want to be a pastor. I was like a hopeful agnostic, right? And I remember the first job I got in university, my roommate and I started working for the catering company that serviced the university. We had a cafe and we did all these big catering events. And the two guys who ran the catering company were Danny and Joe. And Danny and Joe were great guys. They were so nice to us and we loved working there and we laughed all the time. And Danny and Joe were really good friends. I remember thinking, they're such good friends. I mean, they, they work together, Danny and Joe, and they, they, they hang out after work together and they even have a house together. In my suburban oblivion, I didn't realize that Danny and Joe were a couple. I remember thinking like an old Italian grandmother, I hope Danny and Joe find a nice girl and settle down one day, right? <laughs> and so there I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I work for a gay catering company. They were gay and everyone in the catering company was gay other than my roommate and I, and they probably thought that we were gay. And here's the sad thing, friends. At the time, if I had known when I was offered the job that they were gay, I probably wouldn't have taken it. But it was too late now. I was ruined because I knew them. They were my friends, I loved them. I knew their stories. And so I, I remember thinking, I'm never gonna look at an LGBTQ person the same way again. They're never gonna be a group of people. And I'm, I started to think that way about everyone. What if I could really see people what if I got into people's space and learned their stories and got the true story, not the false story that I inherited? And so ministry sort of began strangely for me. I didn't volunteer, I was drafted. 
my wife and I had drifted from our faith and then we sort of came back to church and we were at this little country Methodist church where we had gotten married a few months earlier. And I was sitting there after service and the service was over. I got a tap on the shoulder. I look up and there was this, this angel. No, I'm kidding. It was a middle-aged woman. But <laughs> she may have been an angel. But this woman said to me, listen, John, I've been thinking about you and praying about you. And I, I think you would make the best youth leader for this church. And I thought to myself, I know you. You're the current youth leader. <laughs> she was looking to get out. She had done her time. She had paid her debt to society. And she wanted to be free. And I fit all the criteria for being a small church youth pastor. I was married, I was young, and I didn't have a criminal record that they were aware of. And see, really, if they had vetted me at all, they would know this guy does not have a strong faith. My faith was a sort of a, being reignited, but they just wanted someone who was available, who was willing, and I was. And so I walked down the steps to this moldy church basement with leaky bean bags and Civil War era couches. You know how it is. And there were five students there and something happened to me. I realized that I had a heart for teenagers. I realized that I loved to talk about faith with people. And so I started down this path to ministry. And something had always stuck in me from the moment that I was aware of Jesus. I was aware of Jesus, what I called his table ministry. The way Jesus used the act of sharing a meal, of breaking bread, as a way to let people know that they were seen and they were heard and that they, they're known, that they matter. See, Jesus was radical in the diversity of his table. He met with priests and prostitutes. He met with the religious elite and the common street rabble. He met with his disciples and he met with his adversaries. He met with his brothers and he even met with his betrayer. How many of us can say that we have a table that is that diverse? And see, when people encounter Jesus, they always left him with more dignity than when they started. They always knew, even if Jesus had hard words for them, that they mattered, that they were respected, that they were loved. But the open invitation of Jesus' table proved problematic for him. People didn't like it. We see the religious people often saying, look at that rabbi, he eats with sinners. And I can imagine it's not explicitly said in the text, but I can imagine that the people of the street weren't really happy that Jesus met with the Pharisees, the religious leaders either. So as I entered ministry, I, um, I assumed that I could be the person I was in Philadelphia. I assumed that as I became a pastor, I could be a pastor with a big table. But I started to learn something little by little. Maybe you've learned it that organized religion can actually shrink your table. It can actually perpetuate the false stories about people. I started to realize that I was no longer in the kind of diversity that I had been in in my daily life. I was surrounded now only by Christians, only by Christians from my church, and only around the Christians in my church who I sort of agreed with. My table had gotten really small. And the only time we started to mix with people who were not Christian or maybe people of color was either to give them something in a missionary experience, a service experience, or to try to convert them with evangelism. And I didn't have peace about that. I didn't, I thought I was a better person before I became a pastor. And I thought, how is that possible? But I kept going. I kept going and ministry was growing. But I started to have all these other nagging questions. Questions about our theology to the gay community. About the doctrine of hell. About the inerrancy of scripture. About how prayer works. Just all these questions. But I knew something. Maybe you've experienced this. That it's really difficult to be fully authentic in a faith community. I started to realize that honesty was going to be a liability for me. Because there were people who were expecting me to say something on Sunday and be someone on Sunday, regardless of whether or not I felt compelled and convicted to be and say that. Do you understand? 
So there was this difference growing between who I felt I was, who I felt Jesus calling me to be, and who I was expected to be on Sunday. And the more these two people got separated, the more duplicity entered my life, and the more hypocrisy, and the more guilt. And I started to become really heavy, even though outside, you would have looked at me and said, that guy's got it made. He's a pastor in a massive church. Everything's going well. I was surrounded by really good people who really did love me. But I had this tension and I knew something was gonna have to give. Six months later, we had started at a new church in Raleigh. And I remember God calling me to leave that church after only six months. And it came in the form of my pastor's voice saying, you're fired. (laughs) I'd like to say it was in my quiet time or in a vision from the heavens. No, it was in a Starbucks on a Thursday afternoon. And I was devastated and I was humiliated. But then almost immediately, I realized something, that I had just been given a gift. Because now, for the first time in decades, as not just a pastor, but as a Christian, I could ask anything and I could say everything. Do you know what it's like to be in a free place where you can ask anything and say everything and it's okay? And shouldn't the church be that place where we can be fully ourselves and say it all and know that we're not gonna be excluded? My wife later said, you know, getting fired was the greatest thing that ever happened to you. I didn't agree with her right away. But I just started saying everything. I started asking anything on this blog that I've been writing. And I wrote that post as Pastor Ray said, what if I have gay children? And then with the matter of hours, my life changed because it reached millions and millions of people. And it was as if God said, okay, you want a big table? I'll give you a big table, see if you can handle it. And so I didn't really know how to deal with all this. Well, I didn't know what to do with it. And so I said, I'm gonna go back to the table again. I'm gonna go back to Jesus' table ministry. I started to imagine and talk to people about how we could create a place where disparate people could come together in a redemptive spiritual community, a place built on radical hospitality and true diversity and real authenticity and agenda-free relationships. That's been the heart of the search as I've looked at Jesus. I wanna share a couple of these table ministry stories with you. And as I read them, we're gonna go through them rather quickly, but what I want you to do is whether you have something to write on and you wanna write it down or you wanna just take a mental note, I want you to make note of the people mentioned in these stories that are not Jesus and the groups of people that are not Jesus. So any person or group of people that's mentioned in these two stories that's not Jesus. So let's read this together. So from Luke's gospel, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting in his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then we're going to look at this other from Matthew's gospel. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. And while he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, A woman came with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. And truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. 
They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Who did you hear in those stories? Who was present? Tax collector? Levi, teacher? Disciples? Pharisees, lepers. I love these two stories. I couldn't tell, I couldn't decide which story to share with you. And then I, I looked at them and I saw the cross section of people and I said, there it is. There's Jesus' ministry, the religious elite and the people of the street. And we've got people who are socially respected and people who are abhorred. And there is Jesus and, and there's Judas. And they're all there and they all have fellowship with Jesus because see, even more so then than now, Gathering with someone for a meal was a sign of approval, a sign of willing to be associated with the other. And Jesus is saying, here is the heart of God. I'm not just going to be with the people of the street. I'm not just going to be with the well-respected, neat people. I'm going to be with humanity. And friends, this is where Jesus calls us to be. The second story, I want to bring up that second story. Can we just show that first screen? This passage of scripture, the woman with the alabaster jar, it's been one of my favorite stories of Jesus since I was young. I studied it and I've read it and I've given retreats on it. And this week it blew my mind because I had missed something. I want to just read. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were screaming to arrest Jesus and secretly kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. Listen, while he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper. Do you see how powerful that sentence is? I always looked at this story as it's about the woman with the alabaster jar of perfume. But I missed this sentence that Jesus is in the home of a leper. The people who were the most despised in the community. The people who had to say unclean and wear bells so they didn't run into the religious people and get what was on them onto the religious people. This is who Jesus is choosing as a house guest. This is, he's going to be the guest of this man. Church, do you see how beautifully radical that is? If we are to emulate Jesus, we are to be the people of the biggest table See, what Jesus doesn't allow, he doesn't allow our false stories about people. Jesus always pushes us past the distance of our fears and our prejudice and our preference. Jesus doesn't allow us to generalize or stereotype or caricaturize people. When we follow Jesus all the way to the table to a diverse group of people in relationship, well, he blows up our false stories. We're forced to recognize the very specific humanity and the divinity in every person we encounter. We no longer live with people groups. We no longer live with sides. We no longer live with divisions. We live with people who are made in the image of God. And you have to ask yourself today, who do I look at and not see the image of God, whether on purpose or not? Who do I look at as less than? Because I'll tell you the truth, if you see anyone that way, it's a false story about them that you're listening to. And this is on display in Jesus' life and ministry. Read the gospel stories, see how he gathered, who he gathered with, and realize that this is where he's called us to on this really difficult day. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi, speaking to a largely Jewish audience, and the Jewish people, they had a lot of false stories. They had false stories about Samaritans. And then Jesus tells them the story about the Samaritan who is the model of mercy. They had false stories about lepers and Jesus said, I'm gonna stay with a leper and I'm gonna touch the leper. I'm gonna show you the true story. The Jews had false stories about the Romans and Jesus meets a soldier and he says, I haven't seen faith like this in any of you. They had false stories about tax collectors and prostitutes. And Jesus says to the religious people, they're entering the kingdom ahead of you because they get it and you don't. He blows up the stories. See, the, the reason Jesus blows up the false stories is he, he, because he demands that we have proximity with people. Not just geographic proximity. 
Not just physical proximity, not just sitting next to them in worship, but emotional proximity where we are invested in relationships with people who are not like us. Or we don't believe are like us. See, faith is relational, right? We have this relationship with God, but this relationship with one another that is supposed to mirror that relationship. We give compassion and mercy and love and forgiveness. We receive compassion and mercy and love and forgiveness. Without that, we don't have a faith that's made of anything real. And the seed of all bigotry and all discrimination and all homophobia is believing that the difference between us is more important than what is the same about us. And that is what we need to abandon now. When we have proximity to people, we can't put them into categories and we can't project our fears onto them. And the myth of our separation vanishes and we realize our connectedness because church, if we can't see every single person as connected to us, we have no business claiming Christ. This is where we need to live as a people. This is the space that Jesus occupied. It's the space we have to occupy in this space and time in history. In these heavy days, I mean, like Jesus, we need to be the ones who are creating conversation where there had been silence. We need to be the ones who are nurturing relationship where there had been estrangement. We need to be speaking out for justice on behalf of those who have been treated unjustly. We need to be standing in solidarity with people who've been marginalized. And so if we're not people of color and we claim Christ, it's not enough to believe that black lives matter. It's not enough to even say or post that black lives matter as important as that is. But we should be with our brothers and sisters of color as they protest, as they grieve, as they fight for systems that have been against them. We need to brave family members and friends and neighbors who don't understand and don't value them. We cannot be people who only believe that black lives matter in somewhere in here because guess what? That doesn't help. It only helps us feel better about ourselves. And I look at the LGBTQ community who I love dearly. And it's not enough to say, you know what? I believe that people who are LGBTQ are made in the image of God. It's not enough. You need to be entering into relationships with actual people, sharing life with them, including them in the church, making sure that they get leadership positions, saying with your life that they are made in the image of God. For our Muslim brothers and sisters who are being persecuted unjustly, we have to step in and as a church, as people of God say, this is not acceptable. We have to be a people who say, I'm gonna tell you the true stories. I'm not gonna let false stories about people of color or gay people or Muslims fly anymore. I'm gonna tell you the true story and they're made in the image of God and you're gonna treat them like they're made in the image of God. It's not just believing something, it's loudly living this thing that you believe. It's no longer an option just to be silent and feel bad and feel good about yourself for feeling bad. And this is hard work. I mean, friends, hear me. This is not just I'm saying it and it's easy, right? This has been my life for the past couple of years and I realize that the more you try to expand the table, the more you step into the mess of humanity. Right? The more you expose people's fears, the more you touch the tender places of their woundedness, the more you rattle their places of comfort and privilege. And I'm sorry, but they are going to get pissed off. They're going to respond vigorously and violently to you because some people are comfortable with the small table. So there's a cost. There's a cost to following Jesus all the way to the table. It may cost you friends or family members or a job, and it's worth it. I'm not wishing that you'll get fired necessarily. But for me, I needed that freedom to walk into the life that I feel God is calling me to walk into. 
my son, he's 11, but he was about nine and this whole blog thing was blowing up and he walks in and he said, uh, mom and dad, I have a question. I said, yes. And he said, why does everyone hate daddy? I said, don't listen, that's just your mother, son. Don't listen to her. But I said, listen, daddy's saying some things that some people don't wanna hear and that's okay, they're gonna be angry, but I'm still gonna say those things. And that's what we need to do right now. We're gonna have resistance. The love of God will always face resistance. The expanding of the table will always get pushed back, push harder. Live that love loudly, friends. Because if the church is silent right now, that's gonna be our greatest sin. Expanding the table is gonna erase the false stories. But the people who we're talking about they deserve that. They deserve the work it's gonna take for the church. And this leads us all to this place, to this chair that you're sitting in right now. Who are your lepers? Who are your Pharisees? Who are your Samaritans? Who are your tax collectors? And who are the people that you're content to live a false story about? I've been pretty outspoken in the last couple of weeks about supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. But I was driving down here from Raleigh and I decided I was gonna stop at the hotel for the night about halfway. And I got into my hotel room and I turned on the news and they showed me the protests that were happening here in Atlanta. And the first thing I thought, the first thing that came into my head was, oh, I'm lucky I avoided that. And then God snapped me back and said, Avoided it, you're supposed to be there. This is where Christians and church leaders need to be. It's not a metaphorical, I'm with you. It's I'm physically standing with you. So I grieved that about myself. Because here's the deal. Do you know where the easiest place to be a Christian is? It's right here and right now. Surrounded by people who are singing what you're singing who seem to believe what you believe, who are amening what you're amening. It's never gonna get easier to be a person of Christ. But when we leave here, this is when the test of our faith begins. There's so much fear and there's so much hurt and there's so much damage around us. We need to be the people that step into it and perpetuate Christ. My prayer for me, my prayer for you, for this church, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, that we walk into it, that we follow Jesus all the way to the messy table where humanity is seen as equal and beautiful and loved. So friends, may it be so in us. Let's pray together. God, following you is not easy. Loving is difficult because if it wasn't, everyone would be doing it. We don't wanna be Christians in name only, God. We ask you to give us eyes to see the people in our lives who we looked at as less than, who we've kept at a distance. We may have embraced some and, and kept others away. And God, we need the courage to be a people who sit with others and see them and hear them and listen to their stories. God, let us not perpetuate false stories. And God, for many of us, the greatest false story right now that we're telling ourselves is that we are a people of equality. God, let it be so in our lives. Let us be the radical, beautiful, relentless expression of Jesus. Let us be a people of life in your name, amen.